Welcome back to Derm Docs, everyone. If you haven't already, don't forget to rate, subscribe, or follow, and leave us a five-star review. Thank you so much for listening. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Patrick Bitter, who is a board-certified dermatologist, pioneer, educator, and world-renowned expert in energy-based skin solutions. He was also just featured in the cover story of March 2022's edition of Top Doctor Magazine for his discovery of pulse light and its usefulness, effectiveness, and versatility in treating a multitude of skin problems. Just wait till you hear all he has to say. Welcome, Dr. Bitter. You'll present a session at the 2022 South Beach Symposium discussing energy-based devices for facial rejuvenation. Very interesting. Can you please give the listeners a little glimpse of what will be covered? Oh, thank you, Melissa. Um, this is a very exciting time for aesthetic practitioners and for our patients uh, as advances in energy-based devices have made correcting skin uh, easier and more effective than ever before. At the South Beach Symposium West in Southern California this fall, I will be speaking on an exciting new advance from Cyton with high-speed, high-energy um, skin rejuvenation with broadband light. This new innovation in technology has allowed us to be able to develop new procedures and protocols that make treating skin even easier for our patients. And uh, the results are, are more dramatic and more effective than ever before. We've been able to develop with the new high-speed uh, BBL technology protocols and techniques. For example, I'll be talking about a motion technique as opposed to the traditional use of IPL with stamping technique. And I'll be talking about protocols that are multi-pass, multi-step protocols that have really allowed us to be able to treat skin faster, treat it easier. The treatments are safer than they ever have been before. And and more comfortable for our patients uh, while really moving us finally to what I consider the holy grail of skin rejuvenation. And that is being able to take skin of any age and have it look like young people's skin, to be able to make that skin look healthier and clearer uh, like young people's skin looks. So for us, this is a very exciting time. And I'm very excited about the opportunity to present my experience and my work in this area at the South Beach Symposium on the West Coast in Southern California this fall. Wow, that's amazing. And it sounds life changing for many people, too. And speaking of these treatments, um, what technology would you suggest for a patient with acne scarring or maybe an uneven skin texture who hasn't seen results from first line treatments? Well, as you know, um, acne scarring is, is really common and can be for many people a very distressing problem and can also be very challenging for aesthetic practitioners like myself to, to really be able to treat. So I think one of the biggest and most exciting advances has been discovering the that the early treatment of inflammatory acne in the very early stages uh, when people are in their teens with broadband light not only can uh, dramatically improve uh, inflammatory acne and clear skin and clear the red marks and the purple marks and, and the hyperpigmentation that inflammatory acne lesions often end up leaving, um, but regular uh, early intervention with treatments with broadband light can not only clear acne, but it can help prevent the ravages of really ongoing acne and chronic acne that in the teen years and into the early 20s that leaves people with pitted acne scars and with depressed acne scars that we then later in their life find it, you know, can be challenging to treat with a variety of other technologies. So early treatments with broadband light, when people are in their teens and have early acne, can tremendously help prevent the, develop, uh, the, the really onset of um, severe acne scarring. And that is a very exciting area that right now not very many people know about and isn't that well appreciated, but uh, I will be touching upon that at South Beach Symposium uh, West. Oh, awesome. So they also could be a candidate for what you developed, the photo facial procedure. Um, who would be the prime candidate for this service? Well, 
when I first began to work with intense pulse light and developed the procedure that was the uh, use of intense pulse light for treating the entire face and doing a series of treatments that we've come to call the photofacial procedure. Um, we, we really limited the treatments primarily to people that had redness on their face or rosacea or sun damaged skin. Uh, but over the 25 years that I've worked with light and treating humans and, and treating skin, uh, we've come to appreciate that that light is almost magical and, and it has uh, other benefits as well. And the other benefits are that light makes skin healthier. It helps keep skin healthier and it slows down age-related changes. And so now appreciating that regular treatments with broadband light can help keep your skin healthy, can help keep your skin younger looking and can slow down aging. Pretty much everybody is a candidate for broadband light. And those benefits of keeping making skin healthy, keeping it healthy and slowing down aging, we now, especially with the high-speed, high-energy broadband light technology that's been innovated, which I'll be talking about in my presentations, um, we, we can now really rejuvenate and, and delay aging on skin anywhere or all over the body for people. And we really have finally moved to a place that 20 years ago, uh, even 10 years ago, we only dreamt about. And that is we can now make a promise to our patients. If you come and see us and get regular treatments with BBL, starting in your 30s or 40s, we can keep your skin young looking into your 60s, 70s, and 80s. And I'll be talking about that and presenting that. This has been, so really pretty much everybody is a candidate for um, photofacial procedures and, and use of uh, BBL or broadband light. That's amazing. And is it a case-by-case -case basis, just out of curiosity, just or or how many treatments, or does it vary per person? Well, if you, if you are wondering, well, what is kind of the best treatment for each person? Um, we've mm -hmm. learned so much about how to use broadband light uh, with um, protocols and techniques that have worked out uh, and the parameters or settings that it, it really has become so much simpler. And you can look at somebody who has issues, age-related changes on their skin and use a protocol with BBL for correcting their skin. You can look at people mm -hmm. who have really nice skin and you can use a protocol that helps helps keep skin looking nice. And then you can uh, use those protocols that I've developed for people once you've corrected their skin, let's say they're in their 40s or 50s or 60s, they have redness, sun damage, and now they don't have that anymore because of the treatments you've done with the broadband light. And, um, and now you can use a much a simple, easy protocol to keep skin looking that nice. That's the way I treat my skin. That's the way I treat my wife's skin. Mm -hmm. um, now that, you know, the uh, age-related changes and sun damage that I used to have in my skin is all gone. I use broadband light to just keep my skin looking younger and healthier and, and, and nicer looking. So uh, we've those have all been worked out. Life for us aesthetic practitioners and for our patients is with in the world of uh, energy-based devices and in particular uh, BBL has become so much simpler and easier because all the work has really been done. You just need to look at your patient and look at what they have and decide what the best protocol for them is. Okay. Definitely makes sense. And um, as you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed some unexpected challenges for providers in many medical subspecialties. Have you observed any new patient complaints, surge requests for certain procedures, or anything else like that? Well, in the uh, early part of 2020, with the onset of the COVID pandemic, um, it, it, it created a very challenging uh, overnight uh, situation for, for everybody. And, and the pandemic over the last two years has affected everybody. But one of the really uh, unexpected consequences or outcomes of the pandemic has been the surge in demand for all kinds of aesthetic procedures, including cosmetic surgery. And I've been fascinated by, by this. Um, what, what is bringing uh, all these people to my practice 
practice, in my own experience, and to my colleagues that I've talked to and their experience, it's really been the same everywhere around the country. What is bringing all these people who either have never done any kind of procedure before, or people who have been, you know, getting periodic treatments with fillers or Botox or uh, uh, a light-based treatment like BBL, and, and, and they haven't done that for two years or three years or four years or five years, what is bringing these people back? And, and I've been really fascinated by that. And, and in my experience, this is what I, I've learned. Um, first, I think that uh, the, um, the effect really on people with the pandemic where all of a sudden we, we found ourselves in the world where um, you know, we're surrounded by bad news and every day it seems like you're hearing bad news about the, the outcomes uh, with uh, um, the death from COVID and the rising number of cases and the overwhelmed hospitals and hospital workers and, and the, um, the, the uh, limitations and shutdowns that became a normal part of our lives. Um, when, when it seems like everything around you in the world is bad, um, uh, by going and doing something for yourself that makes you feel better, it really, at least you could do something that you felt good about uh, and, and had some control over. And that's one of the reasons I have found that has prompted people to come in to seek aesthetic treatments when maybe they've never done them before uh, is is the interest to want to feel good about something and feel good about themselves. Um, the second uh, really interesting part of that that has brought people in is that, uh, you know, people have had more discretionary income. They haven't, many people have, not everyone, but many people who, you know, were accustomed to going on a very nice vacation with their family once or twice a year, weren't able to do that, uh, mm -hmm. have, you know, family gatherings uh, that, you know, they would spend a certain amount of money on or travel to see their family. And, and they've been limited in doing that, have now had a bit more discretionary income. And they decided, well, I'm going to spend spend some money on myself then. Um, and, uh, and that has also been, I think, partly what has driven the surge in cosmetic uh, treatments and cosmetic procedures. And, and then uh, I think interestingly is people have always been interested in wanting to do something, uh, do things that made them feel better about how they looked. And uh, I, I think that with the pandemic, it really brought to people's awareness and attention, how fleeting life is and how how quickly it could just come to an end. And I think many people began to reflect on well, what really is important. And in a world where it seemed so uncertain of what was happening and we were surrounded by so much bad news, to, to really be able to do something um, and, and where we felt we really had very little to no control. We were being told you have to wear a mask. We were being told you can't travel. We were being told you have to keep away from people. We were being told that kids can't go to school. And a lot of what we had taken for granted for was taken away from us. What we could do is we could do something about ourselves. And and despite the masking, despite the social distancing, people were willing to come to my office, willing to come to practitioners' offices, take off their mask, be in close contact with the practitioner for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, completely the opposite of what we we're being told to do with social distancing. And they were willing to do that, to do something for themselves that made them feel good. And it at least gave them some sense of control in their life. And I think these three different factors um, have really been partly to explain the, the uh, partly to explain this surge that we've seen and de in demand for aesthetic procedures uh, and cosmetic surgery. Uh, it's been a, a fascinating time um, and, and just watching people's response to uh, this worldwide crisis that uh, has had a very unexpected um, uh, boon in, in the area of aesthetic and cosmetic medicine. Yeah, those are some wonderful points. Thank you. Um, wow. I mean, when you look, when you feel good, you know, when you look good, you feel good too <laughs> on the outside. So, mm -hmm. and definitely. and in particular, when you consider that we we've been through a two year period of time where we've felt like we've had very little control over what's happening in the world and even in our own lives, mm -hmm. you could go and do something. Uh, 
that was within your control um, that made you feel good and made you feel better about something in the world and better about how you looked. And uh, I think that's been definitely uh, the, the pandemic has had that psychological impact on people and been part of the reason why we've seen this, this tremendous surge and a very substantial surge in, in interest in cosmetic procedures. Mm-hmm. So your practice is in California and SBS is launching a new event at the Terrainier Resort in Southern California this fall. And we're so excited. Um, Can you please explain if patients on the West Coast have different aesthetic ideals than East Coast patients? Ah, this is a very interesting question. Um, And and this is my opinion on that. Uh, The perception, or I would more accurately say really the misperception that people living on the West Coast have a greater desire to do aesthetic procedures. They have a greater desire to to look uh, done um, or even unnatural, if you would, um, is is largely really uh, been driven by West Coast media and Hollywood and not by patients, because in my experience, in my own practice, uh, and the time that 14 years that I had a a, a practice in the Beverly Hills area as well, um, I can tell you that, that what people want is pretty much universal. And people want to feel good about how they look, and they want to look natural. So at the end of the day, That's what our patients are coming to see us for, all aesthetic practitioners, whether it's a dermatologist like myself who is focused on making their skin look healthier and younger, or a cosmetic surgeon that is going to do a surgical procedure. People want to feel good about how they look, and they want to look natural. And that's true, I think, universal. There are differences between aesthetic practitioners between the East Coast and the West Coast. So there are some differences. Uh, One example of that is IPL. Uh, Intense pulse light technology was much more readily embraced on the West Coast and in Midwestern states, uh, Texas, for example, than the East Coast, especially the North Atlantic uh, uh, and and Middle East. uh, I mean, um, uh, the um, Uh, the um, Northeast uh, part of the U.S., where IPL was really readily less embraced by aesthetic practitioners. And so the procedures uh, that are have been recommended, there is a variation um, of what procedures West Coast and East Coast doctors might prefer and they might promote to their patients. And IPL is one example of that. Um, that's become less and less over the years as, as people, uh, aesthetic practitioners and the public have come to appreciate how magical light is. And, and you really do need light if you're an aesthetic practitioner at some point to offer to your patients. Um, uh, and, and the other part I think that has contributed to that perception or misperception that people on the West Coast, you know, uh, prefer overdone lips and overfilled faces and, and three facelifts to tighten their faces um, in a very unnatural way is, is uh, the expertise or lack of expertise on practitioners, I do think you see more overfilled faces and overfilled unnatural looking lips on the West Coast, some parts of the West Coast, than you do in the Midwest and and the East Coast. And I think that that's not so much a patient demand uh, or a difference in how people on the West Coast want to look. It is the lack of experience of practitioners. And I think the West Coast tends to attract a lot more people wanting to come here and be an aesthetic practitioner. And not all of them have a lot of experience and they don't do lips very well and they don't fill faces very well. And so I think Hollywood, um, the media on the West Coast and the visibleness of people um, to the rest of the country uh, on television and on film um, where you see mostly West Coast people looking overdone has really not been because patients want to look that way. It's, uh, it's because of lack of expertise in practitioners um, uh, and uh, sometimes celebrities just go to people that don't have that much experience and they don't get very good results and I get to see them to fix that. So um, uh, I, I think that it's a very interesting question. And I, I just, in my opinion, uh, over all these years, it is not the really the, the driven that 
that differences that you might see between the work that aesthetic work that's done on the West Coast and the East Coast, it's not driven by patients, it's driven by practitioners' you know, preference, but also what you see that in particular the media and Hollywood. Um, so uh, that's my opinion on that. And uh, I think that uh, a meeting like SBS West, where you bring East Coast and West Coast experts and teachers, um, is, is a great opportunity where we share really uh, maybe regional variations in, in preferences for techniques or preferences for energy-based devices. Um, and uh, people then begin to, to uh, share their expertise and knowledge, and, and you just overall end up with a higher level of expertise among aesthetic practitioners. Uh, and meetings like SPS West are fantastic for, uh, I think, being a rich source of sharing the information that uh, and and differences in how we may practice across the U.S. Okay, so the main point here is that everyone should book an appointment with you. All celebrities and everyone <laughs> go to Dr. Bitter. <laughs> well, if you want to go see a person that uh, has a passion for making skin look young and healthy mm -hmm. uh, and has a lot of expertise with that, and if you want to go and see somebody that uh, loves to make lips look beautiful but not done, well, that's me. So, uh, because that's what I love, that's what I love doing. Um, and uh, uh, one of the reasons I'm invited to speak and share what what I have a passion for and what I spend really my professional time doing day in and day out is uh, making skin look more attractive and having people uh, uh, feel good about how they look. And that's what I do. And that's what I love doing. Yeah, that's amazing. And you're very passionate about it and you, you love it. So that's what's important. So what nuances do you think attendees at SBS West will experience in an agenda tailored to the West Coast audience? Um, I think attendees at SPS West in Southern California this fall will be really treated to the best of what the South Beach Symposium has always been about, and that's well-respected expert speakers and teachers and um, uh, up-to-date contemporary topics at a collegial gathering in a beautiful location. Uh, SPS West, I think, really will offer all of what we've come to love and appreciate about South Beach Symposium. And uh, really, SPS West will be a meeting that uh, you won't want to miss. Yay, well, we're so excited to have you and we can't wait for your lecture. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. And, and really, I appreciate the opportunity to speak and, and attend the meeting. I get as much out of uh, meetings like SBS West uh, and in, in terms of what I learn from just uh, uh, discoursing and, and uh, meeting up with my colleagues, meeting new people, listening to new speakers. Um, uh, it's, it, these meetings are so worthwhile. And so uh, I'm thrilled to get to be there and have an opportunity to share what I love doing and what I, my expertise is. Well, we're thrilled as well. And thank you so much for all of your insight today. It's been a true pleasure talking with you. Wow, it's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.